I spoke a lot in the last uh, segment, so without further ado, I'm joined now by Jonathan Evison, the best-selling author of six novels, including today's Velshi Band book club feature, Lawn Boy. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me, Ali. Seven, but who's counting? Seven novels. <laughs> Seven. Uh, there you go. You That's... pretty much said it all. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm ready. This is you, your summation of the novel is great. Thank you for mentioning that the book has humor uh, that gets lost often in this, uh, you know, in, in the dialogue about this book. Um, you know, I grew up in punk bands in the early '80s, so you know, rattling cages is nothing new to me. And and, and I knew when I wrote this book that I was dealing with some sort of sen sensitive and controversial uh, or divisive issues anyway. I mean, uh, wealth and equity, racial assumptions, the perils of late capitalism. And, and for me, front and center, the inherent inequities of, of the American dream. So um, this isn't my first book or my last book that asks the same question, which is, has America made good on all its grand promises? And, and uh, you know, uh, Mike's just looking for a piece of the pie, and he's finding, you know, one after another, a big steel-toed Kodiak boot to the face. Yeah, a good uh, cultural reference that my uh, people my age will remember. Uh, let's uh, let's come down to the, the, the book banning. Uh, it comes down to a singular moment in Lawn Boy that has fueled all of the calls for ban. If you could go back, would you still include the passage that that woman read in uh, in, in that Texas uh, call for a banning? Well, absolutely. And you know, as you mentioned, uh, it was presented to the to the school board in the school board meeting, uh, devoid of any context. Mm -hmm. um, the context is very important to the scene, which is only about a paragraph long, really. But Mike uses some very coarse language, not graphic, but coarse language, to to describe a sexual experimentation he had with another boy uh, in his preteen years, and he he is you know intentionally using that very coarse language. Uh, for the specific reason of, of, of you know, shocking his best friend, who's really homophobic, who's been, you know, without even knowing Mike is uh, non-binary, sort of teasing him about uh, being a, a fag or whatever, just because he reads poetry, you know, and things like that. And so he's basically coming out to Nick in, in the scene. So he uses very, not even very, but just coarse language to sort of shock him. And so obviously I think the context is really important but again, it was not graphic language. It's nothing you're not going to see in any, you know, R movie. Toward the end of the book, uh, Mike comes out to his mother. I want to read a quote from the book in which he says, Mom, maybe you ought to sit down, I said at last. She paused in her scrubbing. Michael, what's wrong? Well, it turns out that, well, that what? Mom, I'm gay. Visibly relieved, she resumed, scrubbing the mirror. Oh, thank God. I thought you had a tumor. Uh, Mike goes on to reflect on his partner, Andrew's much more negative coming out experience with his family. Talk to me about this moment, this culmination of much introspection that literally everybody who is gay goes through with their parents. Sometimes it's a really good experience and sometimes it's the worst experience of their life. Well, I'd say Mike is lucky because, it's, you know, like all great moms, she just knows already. So, right. I'd say and so does Freddie. Everybody but Nick, everybody in his life sort of kind of intuits it before Mike. And this is a story I've heard before for people who come out uh, later in life. Uh, you know, I'm not gay myself. I'm cisgender white male. So what am I doing writing this book, I guess? Well, I it was very important to me to write this book because, again, I just think that uh, even myself, there's a lot of privileges I take for granted. Uh, I think that there's this inherent, uh, there's this this American mythos that the, the the American dream is open for all of us and we can all be whoever whoever we want. And uh, it's a lot harder for for uh, people of color and uh, people of uh, non-binary persuasions. And uh, I think there's a lot of obstacles that just because people don't deal with them, they're they're unwilling to admit are there. Um, I, I find it interesting that Mike has been equated endlessly, it seems, uh, with Holden Caulfield. Uh, for instance, in the New York Times, they called, uh, they referred to Mike as a, as a Holden Caulfield for the new millennia or something like that. And I get that. I mean, it's, it's a compliment. I get it. A young, irreverent narrator who's disaffected. But, like, really, Mike is the complete antithesis of Holden Caulfield, who's like a, you know, uh, wealthy sort of, uh, I mean, he's suffering from affluenza, post-war American 
you know, he, he dropping out of prep schools, wandering around uh, the Upper East Side of Manhattan, paying visits to his professors. Uh, you know, Mike is scrounging for change in his couch cushion and, you know, uh, pulling his own teeth out with, you know, uh, pliers. So, I mean, they're, they're really the antithesis. And, I, and this is this is the story I wanted to tell. I mean, if anything, if I were to have conceived Holden Caulfield in this book, I, I, I had conceived writing the antithesis of Holden Caulfield. Let me uh, ask you about a moment that resonated with me when Mike was describing how important the library was to him as a younger person, because that's relevant to a book club. Uh, quote, the library was the most stable thing in our lives. At the library, a little ferret of a kid like me had a chance. The only currency he needed was a library card, end quote. I love that. Elaborate on that for me. Well, this comes just directly from my life. You know, I had a working single mom and I spent a lot of time in the library. And this, of course, is the 70s when all, you know, almost invariably librarians were women with these, you know, uh, translucent stockings, formidable women. Uh, they were like my sisters of mercy. I mean, I, I, I became an autodidact. I call it an autodidact at a young age, but really I have librarians to thank for that. So technically I'm not an autodidact. Uh, librarians have played a huge part of my role. Uh, you know, a huge role in my my development as a person, not only in childhood, but through adult. It just, as it happens, I have many friends that are uh, librarians. Uh, uh, librarians are, and, and they're the ones that are really in the trenches going to bat for me here. You know, I mean, uh, I, I've had some threats and cyber attacks, and it's been a big hassle and very, very uncomfortable for me throughout this book banning process. Uh, but, you know, it's the librarians and the educators that have really been out in the trenches fighting for me, uh, risking losing their job, uh, you know, not yeah. not with with none of the benefits. You know, if nothing else, at least I'm getting look, I'm on your show. Right. You know, I'm selling some books. These people are uh, and I've been in I've been there firsthand. I've seen yeah. it. I was in uh Idaho, uh, I was in Boise when the legislation was, they were trying to push some legislation. It was like seven in the morning on the first day of spring break or something like that, where they were actually trying to uh, pass a bill that would uh, make it illegal, that you, that you could sue a bookstore or a library yeah. for because you were offended by their content. And, and like, I mean, the, this is what this is what librarians and educators are up against. And we'll and have just, the uh, we'll have the librarians on as well, because you're absolutely right. We think every time we talk to authors, we realize it's librarians and the and the teachers who are on the front lines of this thing. Uh, thank you. They're for my heroes. This. Yeah, they, they should be. No, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you for reading. It's such a careful and thoughtful reading. What a pleasure. I wish everybody Jonathan. read it that way, right? Jonathan Evison is the author of Lawn Boy, today's feature for the Velshi Band Book Club.